Some of y'all are like, oh, but I've heard all it takes is faith the size of a mustard seed. Amen. A little bit of faith. And that's absolutely true. A little bit of faith. And why does it take just a little bit of faith? Because it's what we put our faith in. And that is a great God. Amen. A huge God. The God of this universe. Our creator. The one who lives and breathes to this day. His living word. Amen. But to grow in faith. It's very important for a Christian to grow in faith. In other words. There's more to just being saved. James said, faith without works is dead. What does that mean? Do you have to work for your salvation? No. It is finished, is what Jesus said at the cross. He paid it all at the cross. That's where our salvation was won for eternity, to where the penalty for our sin was won, to where now Jesus, who took on the sin of man, amen, because he was sinless, he knew no sin, and he took sin. Our sins and those who repent and believe in his mighty name are saved and have salvation. But Peter's speaking to the church. He's writing to them. And let's start with verse three. That's where we're going to start with our opening text from scripture. Heavenly Father, in Jesus name, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. We come to you with prayer, Lord, and we ask for your word to be spoken here today. Let not my words be spoken here today, Lord, but your words, your scriptures as they are written. We ask for you today, Lord, if there is anything that I say, let it be erased from everyone's memory that comes from just me. Lord, we turn to you to edify us in your word. And today, as we come to you and we learn about growing spiritually through your word and what you promised us. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Uh, verse 3. Verse 3, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Let's start with this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. See, spiritual growth is a reality for every believer because it has already been given to us. Everything that is required for the spiritual life has been given to us through the foreknowledge of God. This happens upon the point of salvation. When we repent and we believe, you get blessed with the Holy Spirit. Your scales are removed from your eyes. And now you have what Jesus says so often when you read in the parables and through his teachings. Those who have an ear... Let them hear. And we can hear his word today. Uh, the spiritual blessings that we need are already available to us. If you read in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, I'm going to read it real quick for time's sake. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. But it's up to us. Understand this. They've already been available, but it's up to us to access them through our spiritual life that we live. These comprehensive blessings are appropriated through the knowledge of God. That is through the specific knowledge of God's will for the blessings to believers. See, this knowledge, to sum it up, is the difference between knowing Jesus Knowing who he is and having a personal relationship with him. If we look at the, in a secular world, right? How many of us, uh, let's just say the president of the United States. It, it's one thing to meet him. It's another thing to know him. And you have more access with Jesus because we are to know him. Have this personal relationship with him. Can you imagine having a personal relationship with the president of the company that you work with? There's a big difference there, isn't there? Knowing someone and having that personal relationship with them. Brothers and sisters, we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He knows you by name. The Bible says that he has the hairs of your head 
number, that he thinks about you more than their sands on the seashore. You are in your heavenly father's thoughts. He knows who you could be before you, the foundation of the earth was ever laid. And this spiritual realm that we're talking about, in verse 4 it says, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. There are many keys to spiritual growth, but this is a key. What is the key? Sharing in the divine nature. Sharing in the divine nature, which penetrates and lives within every believer, beginning at the moment of salvation through the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? We're talking about God's nature here being woven into you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's very important to understand the nature of God. His attributes and that very nature. Now, there's an expectation and you have the ability now as a believer. For the spiritual growth, that divine nature, and that includes a spiritual appetite and godly behavior. Now, we can never be gods. And a lot of people, I understand, misinterpret this, but we are not gods. I want to make that very clear. You are not God. That divine nature now dwells in you and gives you the power to represent him in a godly manner through the foreknowledge that he has given us. And that is very important for our spiritual nature. See, the divine nature is implanted in us in, in seed form. In 1 Peter verse 23, it says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Let's say that again, through the living and enduring word of God. And that doesn't immediately translate into maturity, okay? Spiritual maturity and godly living. Rather, it gives every Christian Every believer, the ability, the potential to escape the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. And much like that seed that is given to a gardener, it's given to the person who, who possesses it to grow, to grow in that potential. Have you ever gotten a pack of seeds and you try to plant something? It gives you instructions about what type of soil to use, how often to water it, how much sunlight needs to be in there. See, we share a responsibility in our relationship with God. He's given us a seed, an imperishable seed, one that will never, ever dwindle away. It is there forever because it's given to you by God Almighty himself. But we have to cultivate that through the knowledge that he has given us in his word for the spiritual growth. See, when we tend to that seed and it grows, the life of the spirit expands in every believer's soul. And that expansion is manifested in the body through righteous living. What is righteous living? That is living by the commandments of God, the expectations that he puts forth for how we are to live, to live in his word, to represent him well here. He's given us that power. He's given us that seed, that imperishable seed. Verses five through six, beautifully written. For this reason, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. See, for the divine nature to truly express itself and to manifestly 
in every believer's life, the believer must make every effort to supplement their faith. Supplement their faith with these things that say, add to your faith. God said, you need to add these things to your faith for godly living. To let that seed grow, to let that light truly manifest itself in your body, to expand in your soul. You know, the number seven, he listed seven things here. That represents completeness in the Bible. And this new nature has already been programmed in you to respond. That's the amazing thing about it. You're already programmed. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, you're programmed to respond to this nature. So you're seeking it now. You almost, you have a desire for it because now it's no longer you, but it's God's will of your life. And when we follow God's will, these blessings that we so often ask for, we open them up to God and say, God, you said for me to add these things to my faith, these seven things. It's just like a baby. You know how a baby is? The baby's programmed to the mother's milk to already respond and receive and to grow. And there's an infancy stage that babies are at where they get this milk and they grow and they grow. And now they're off the milk. But they've been implanted in them with those nutrients that will carry with them for the rest of their lives, to know how to eat, to know how to walk, to talk. And God teaches us this in a very similar manner as Peter is describing here. And these seven sub supplemental qualities are necessary for spiritual growth. They're goodness. What's goodness? Live it to glorify God. Knowledge, responding to divine revelation. Self-control, that is resisting sinful desires. Endurance, not quitting until God releases you. Goodness, seeking to please God with your choices. Brotherly affection, caring for the well-being of others, members of God's family. Love, compassionately and righteously seeking the well-being of others, including non-believers. And these qualities are like vitamin supplements to our spiritual life, to our spiritual growth and faith. And it's something that every believer that's here today, we must not be stagnant in our faith. We could never, and I know some of us, we feel stuck. Have you ever felt stuck? Like, I, I'm praying. God, I, I, we almost make a checklist of what we need to do every day. I prayed today. I read the word of God. I, I helped somebody. I, I did this. But for growth, spiritual growth, our, our faith to grow more with him, to manifest inside of us, him. One of the keys is the divine nature. And what I'm asking you today, brothers and sisters, do people see Christ if you were to go down this checklist of seven qualities that were listed, would you be able to say, I have this? Uh, goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, love. Are, are we carrying these with us? Because, see, God instructs believers to add these qualities to their life. They're saving faith in order to actualize the potential for maturity and godly living. There's a time where we have to grow up spiritually. And I know that, it, I know it. I'm still growing. Every day God reveals something to me. And this isn't about stumbling. This is, a, this is about a spiritual maturity. This is about accessing what God has told us to access. Peter's talking to them. He's saying, you have your salvation. That is great. But what are you doing for the kingdom of God? What are you doing to represent? Are you growing in faith? And I need, we need to grow in faith. And today, brothers and sisters, as you sit here and you listen to God's word, as you sit and you listen to this preaching, I want you to know I add my faith to yours. And together with our faith, we can see God's work. We can see how we're his workmanship. 
and how these qualities and how we're growing in faith and how we're growing more spiritually to be more like him. Not to become him, but because he has called us to a life of godly living, a life of righteousness. Amen. 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 And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be more godlike. Amen. Every day in what we do, we must never forget. And this is so important, and I've said this many times before, and I get caught up into it too. We must never put the blessing above the giver. Because when it says according to God's will here, that we align with, it's God's will. Not our own desires, but God's desires. See, we can start to treat God like a genie in the lamp if we're not careful. I want this. I want that. And instead of asking God, we start to tell God what's best. And we have to be very careful because there's a very fine line between praying to God and asking God to reveal your will, your desire, put it in my heart. Let me follow you, Lord, to where God I'm demanding this from you because you said you did that. And, and now we're playing God. Now we put the blessing above the giver. We must never do that. We must never forget where the blessings come from. And that is the giver. And then we serve God. And that we know that God made each and every one of us with a plan. And sometimes we don't like the plan. Sometimes we don't like the blessings we get from God. They're blessings. Because it's from him. And why is it from him? Because he set forth before you. He knew what you could be before the foundation of the earth was ever laid. That means you have a purpose. We watch a lot of TV, though, don't we? And the, let me get into the next uh, verse here, okay? <laughs> let me get the next verse. I'm going to start going on and I'm going to be a liar about the time I'm going to take. So let's go to verse 8, okay? If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In increasing measure. That means we're not going to be useless. We're not going to be unfruitful. That means with the gifts that God has given you and the purpose he has for you, you will feed others. See, one thing that we understand there's a point of selfishness when we come to Christ. But that selfishness is, is when we come because we need saving. We realize that we're sinful and that we need a savior. That Jesus would never would have had to gone to the cross if we weren't inherently evil. That from the beginning, that the devil whispered into Adam and Eve's ear that you could be like God. You could be like God. Surely, God, there's things he hasn't told you. And you could be like him. And that's a lie from the devil. And he and we fell from that temptation. And we fall into this fallen state, as the Bible says, to where we're sinful by nature and that we need a savior. That we need to humble ourselves, come before God and say, my way ain't working. I thought I knew everything. In my short time that I've been alive, Lord, you're the the creator of the universe, you're the creator of time and space, but I thought I knew more than you. I thought I knew what was best. And then we come to the realization that through our spiritual growth that now we can no longer be selfish. It's a sacrificial life that we live to bring others to Christ, to show them the goodness of God, where God has set forth for us to go. When God opens those doors, are we afraid to walk through them sometimes? I've been afraid. God's opened doors. And I want to walk through there, God. And then I remember his word that you are not alone. You are not alone. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, I am not alone. Oh, turn to your other neighbor and tell somebody, you're not alone. Because God is with us. And if God is with you, who can be against you? No one. No one will forfeit his plans that have come before you. We have to have that courage to stand, and as his word says, to be strong and courageous. 
in him, for I am the Lord your God, and I have set forth this before you. We serve a mighty God, and there are times, brothers and sisters, there are times when we're afraid. We, we, we feel a fear that comes upon us because it's not our desire. It's not what we want. But it's something that must be done because the selfishness has to go away. We serve God, which means you serve others. The time that I put in to the ministry, and let me tell you about my belief. And I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not boasting. I am not boasting. I am just letting you know now there are other things that I could be doing. If I didn't believe God's word, I would be at the coast right now fishing on my Sunday afternoon. I would be doing this, but I know that eternity is at stake for many souls out there. And I preach his word as I am commanded to do. As he told me, this is your door that you must walk through. This is the pain. This is the suffering. There are rewards, though, as well. It is very rewarding to serve Christ, but it is also very painful. Let's go on. And I'm going to sum this up here. I'm going to continue to read. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For, it is, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Hallelujah. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, but whoever does not have these things, whoever does not possess these spiritual qualities, whoever is not adding this to their growth in their faith, what he's saying is you're nearsighted, you're blind. You only see what's right in front of you, and that's all we really care about. We're not looking at the big picture. You were born to live forever. Physically, your body will die, but your soul will go on to live forever. You were born that way. God himself created your soul and placed you into a body, and he has given us his spirit, the power to which to live by, to spend eternity with him, to glorify his name. And then he said, you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Is there a reward system? Yes. Does this mean you have to work for your salvation? No, you already have it. But there's a reward for Christians in heavenly realms for the kingdom of God for eternity that you will get. There are crowns that you will wear and be given to for what you do here on earth present, representing Christ. Faith without works is dead. And we have to understand this, brothers and sisters. We cannot get this confused. You can't be a stagnant Christian. It's a shame to live your whole life by the power of God and do nothing with what he has given you. To not fulfill the will and desire that he had for your life. It is a shame. Maybe you're young and you're figuring this out right now. God has revealed to you and your father. And that's great. You're going to have a fruitful life. You're not going to stumble. Maybe we're old at this point in our lives. We're closer to death than we were from when we were born, amen, physically. And we're just not, it's not too late for you. It's never too late for the kingdom of God. Get with him. Have this key to spiritual growth. These seven things that Peter listed. First Peter 1. I was going to read a few from First Peter 1, chapter 1. There's a few verses I want to read. Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Christ Jesus and sprinkled with his blood, grace, and peace be your abundance? Verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. What does that mean? As, as Paul said, the Apostle Paul, he said, everything that I do, let it bring glory to God's name. In other words, ask yourself, this action that I'm doing, does it bring God glory? Watching this movie, does it bring God glory? Going to this event, does it bring God glory? And how can I bring glory to God through all that I do? Am I prayed up? 
Do I have these seven key things for spiritual growth inside of me to where other people can see? Or am I just worried about myself, me, myself, and I? And, and, and that's what matters right now, me, myself, and I. It's a wonderful thing to be in the kingdom of God, to be his worker, to be his workmanship, to know that he molds us. He is the potter, we are the clay. The hands of God himself molded you. And when we go into this, it's just oh, verse 21 of 1 Peter chapter 2 reads like this. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. See, we have to trust in God that everything that has been achieved has already been achieved. It's already been achieved. He went forth before you. It's already been done. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. It's up to us to walk through that door. It's up to us to walk in those footsteps. So I will always remind you, verse 12, of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. See, we know these things, but we need that reminder. Amen. People ask me, Pastor, why do you preach the gospel? We're believers because non-believers and believers, we constantly need that reminder. We constantly need God's word. Why do we attend church? To worship and bring him glory. To come together in his body. To unite with one another, brothers and sisters, as we sit here today. To be reminded that he suffered for us. That he already laid the path down to know that we do not need to be afraid. Even when fear creeps up on us, we can turn back and stand on his word. Because there are times when fear creeps up in my life. And I can be so scared. But it's the comfort of God's word. It's the comfort to know that he already set the path. I have, he's already acknowledged that. Verse 13, I think it is right. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside as the Lord Jesus Christ has made very clear to me. Peter's purpose of writing this letter was to remind believers of who they are and that they are established in truth. In truth. But he says something very interesting in verse 14. I'm going to read it again. Listen to the words. Very interesting. Because I know that I will soon put it aside. He's talking about his life. As our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. What do you mean, Peter? That Christ has made it clear to you. See, the Bible says that no one knows upon that day when we shall go and meet our maker. No one knows. But Peter, God truly, I don't know if you want to call it a gift or a curse. But Jesus told Peter exactly what was going to happen to him. Listen to what it says in John 21. It's the last chapter of John, verse 18 through 19. This is Jesus speaking to Peter. Very, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will be stretched out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to Peter, follow me. Peter. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went and did whatever you want. But now you're mature. And I'm telling you, Peter, your hands are going to be stretched out. Whose hands were stretched out on the cross? He told Peter, you're going to be crucified, Peter. You're going to be crucified. And someone else is going to dress you. That means they're going to tell you. How to live your life. They're going to tell you what clothes to wear. They're going to tell you what to do. Are you going to listen, Peter? 
Are you going to follow me? Because I'm the one telling you how to act. I'm the one telling you what you need for spiritual growth. I'm the one telling you what you're going to need in this time of suffering. And then he tells them. He indicated the kind of death he was going to die. That would glorify God. God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Peter was crucified upside down. Upside down crucifixion for Peter. What a wonderful life that he lived in God. Amen. But to God be the glory. That was the plan that God had for Peter's life. To write these letters, these epistles. First and second Peter. To write these things to you and to I. Just today as he did for the, it applies to us today as it did the church back then. That Peter, you're going to suffer. They're going to stretch your hands out, Peter. And my question today is if God could indicate what kind of death you were going to die. One of suffering. Would you follow him? And he told you that God's going to get the glory out of this. Because of the faithful life that you lived in me. Because you knew that self-sacrifice was more important than anything. That your rewards will be great in heaven. Amen. Would you follow him? If Jesus told you all this and said, all right, now come follow me. You'd be scared to walk through that door, wouldn't you? Let's be honest. I would be terrified to walk through that door. I have no idea what end awaits me here on earth. But I do know what awaits me in heaven. And that's who I serve. The one who gave me life for eternity to spend with him. And I can tell you now, just as the Apostle Paul said, that these momentary life afflictions that we face here every day, that the weight of eternal glory far outweighs anything that we face here on earth. Be to be glory in his mighty name, to be with him, to know that he will be with me every second of my life here on earth, and that I will be with him. Every second of throughout eternity. This little years that we have. Even if you live to be a hundred. It goes by like that. James says your life is but a vapor. It's here and it's gone one day. What are we doing? Are we bringing God glory? Are we following him? And brothers and sisters. I look upon you. And I see believers in Christ. But we together you need to unite under his name. We need to read his word and apply it to our lives because we cannot go stagnant in the word of God. We are his workmanship. We need to go out into this world and let that light shine. That light of Jesus. It is his light that will bring people into his kingdom. But all by the power of God. I know we're not used to hearing this. Maybe you haven't been to this church very long. But we preach Christ and Christ crucified, as the Bible says. We preach the word of God. The realities of following God, who he is, his nature. The all-loving, all-powerful, the one who we pray to, the one who heals us, the one who walks with us, the one when we have no understanding of what's happening. The one who doesn't get offended by our questions. The one who comes to you and says, peace be with you. I heard you shout my name. Maybe even cussing me. Peace be with you. I'm here. I'm in your presence. My hand is upon you. Have no fear. Whatever happens now, it's nothing compared to eternal glory. You keep bringing glory to God. In everything that you do. In this weakened vessel that we are in. This fragile body that will break down one day. How we grow older. And we break down. But spiritually. Mature, uh, soul, our soul matures in such a manner. To where we're bursting. With a manifestation of God's light. And people can see his glory. Of what you do. My message today. God's message, what God tells us in his word, grow spiritually. See, 
We all know what it means to be content. Amen? Contentment. There's only one area in our life that we should never be content with. And that's our relationship with him. Because we should constantly covet and want more of him. More of Jesus. Give me more Jesus. Not give me more blessings. No, give me more Jesus. What do you need me to do for you, God? Use me. Use this fragile vessel. As long as I have breath, let your word speak. As long as I have breath and you give me the ability to walk somewhere, to go to the store. Oh, Christ Jesus, let your light shine. Let people know how I make it without the drinking, without the drugs. How do I make it every single day? It's by the power of God and his grace and his mercy that he has in our lives. Parents need this more than ever, amen? For their children. I remember being, oh, hard headed. Never listen to me. When I was younger, I dressed myself. When I was younger, I went where I wanted. Those days are far over and gone. Because now I submit myself to God. Your will, God. You trust me. You lead me. You tell me where to go, and I will go. We need to learn to distinguish the voice of God. The Bible says to test the spirits. What does that mean? That means if you get a message from God, he will speak to you. He will touch your soul. And you feel this is from God. It's okay. You're not offending him. Because his word says, go to the scriptures and search it. My word has been written. And if it does not align with my word, it ain't from me. But as we grow mature, mature Christians, our soul is edified. We have to turn on his word. That's why Bible studies are so important. And we know. We know. Stand to your feet if you're physically able. Please stand to your feet in the reverence of the, the almighty God that we serve. His word today is something that we all need. Every one of us need to hear this. As Peter said, I, I, I know what you believe. I, I know who you trust, but I'm here to remind you. And that's what God, God does. He reminds us of who he is and his ability. And today, as we face this world, as it says in verse 4, I'm going to read it one more time. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. So that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. You are a participation in the divine nature of God himself. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We need to pray. We need to pray for everyone. Believers and non-believers. Amen. We all need forgiveness. Yes. We all want to point to the other person and say, that's the sinner. That's the bad one. No. No. Amen. We need to point to the cross where forgiveness was given. Yes. Yes. Oh, man. Lord, have mercy on us all. And I thank God for his mercy and his grace. Because we are truly his workmanship. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for letting us ask questions that we don't understand. Your word said that your ways are not our ways. That your thoughts are in heavenly realms and we're here on earth. We don't know everything. Far from it. But we know who to turn to. We know who does know everything. Every step that has ever been planted in our lives, Lord, you planned. The sovereign God, the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God, search our hearts today, Lord. Help us. Give us those seven key vitamin nutritions for our soul, Lord, that you said add this to your faith. Today, Lord, we add this to our faith. We thank you, Lord, for the assembly today. As we come together to bring you all honor and glory. As we are dismissed here this morning. 
from your presence. We ask that you stay with us everywhere we go. Let your presence follow us. You are a mighty, great God. All glory to you. Continue to use each and every one of us for your purpose, for your will. And as the blessings come down, we thank you as we gather them. You're the source. Continue to use us as resources to help others. Selfless acts is what we need. Selfless acts as believers. So you get the glory. Because that's who gets the glory. Because you're the one who makes it possible. We ask for all this. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.